So our next speaker, and this is uh, one of the, the great things about running an inst institute like this where we are given total freedom, um, we really wanted to have people who are operating in an unusual space and um, who are very bold and brave and courageous and left field in the way they operate and our next speaker, Simon Morden, is certainly that man. Simon is Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Green Hill & Co, a leading independent corporate advisory firm. He's been practising as a corporate advisor in Australia since 1984, having trained as a chartered accountant in London. He's a passionate collector of contemporary art with a long history of benefaction to the arts. Just hearing about the number of boards he was on last night exhausted me. In 2007, he was appointed chair of the MCA Foundation, which was re-established to raise funds for the $53 million capital campaign for the redevelopment of the Museum of Contemporary Art. To me, one of the most wonderful things about that redevelopment has been the emphasis on education, and I know that's something very close to Simon's heart. In addition to the above, Simon is a director of the Australian Broadcasting Commission and is, importantly, the Australian Commissioner to the 2015 Venice Biennale and he was Commissioner at the last one. He is a member of the International Leadership Council of the New Museum and a member of the International Council of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a member of the Executive Committee of the Tate International Council, which he was saying how much he enjoyed last night. And how close he is to the director there, which is very important for Australia-British relations, and a director of the Sydney Theatre Company and the Garvin Research Foundation, and a member of the Wharton Executive Board for Asia. But above all else, he is a very generous Australian with a very pragmatic, warm, and um, interesting viewpoint on philanthropy. Please welcome Simon Morden. Thank you, Kerry, for those very kind words of introduction. My talk will pick up on many of the themes discussed this morning and pull some of them together. So um, I hope it continues a very lively discussion that I very much enjoyed from this morning. I've been asked to talk to you on how two projects I've been deeply involved with evolved. The first is the redevelopment and expansion of the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia, pictured above me. And the second is the new Australian Pavilion in Venice, and I'll show more images of that later. These are two key pieces of arts infrastructure, one completed and one underway. In each case, I was asked to lead the fundraising process and have been intimately involved in each institution for very many years. Before I describe each project, the rationale, and the fundraising process, I've reflected on some common themes in both of these projects. Firstly, these were both projects that my wife Katrina and I felt very passionate about. The arts and community mean so much to us both. If you want to live in a vibrant community, the type of community we all want to live in, then we both believe the arts are central. We'd been involved with the MCA since prior to its first opening in 1991. I first sat on the board with Rupert in the mid-90s, and we remained very strong supporters of the institution. In the case of Venice, we'd been going to the Biennale for almost 20 years. And in recent years, I'd become involved in the Commissioner's Council, Deputy Commissioner to Doug Hall, who's here today, and then last year and next year as Commissioner for Australia. We believe that to run great art programs and exhibit great art, you need world-class infrastructure. Both of the projects that I discuss will deliver that. Secondly, we both believed in the institution and the leadership of each institution. In the case of the Museum of Contemporary Art, I had been involved in the recruitment of the director, Lizanne McGregor, and we felt that the institution had thrived under her leadership 
and that she had significantly more ambition for the place. In the case of Venice, the late James Strong, as chair of the Australia Council, at the time that the discussions first commenced, was a close friend, as was Cathy Keel. And we have a huge admiration for the current leadership of Rupert Meyer and Tony Grabowski, and Venice director Elaine Shear. Thirdly, whilst it may have looked impetuous, our support for each project was deeply discussed together, and each project had been discussed in the community for many years prior. In the case of the MCA, this was the third attempt, and thankfully successful, with prior initiatives in 1997 and 2001 failing. In the case of Venice, Melbourne restaurateur Ronnie D'Astasio had initiated an ideas competition in 2008, received 168 submissions. Ronnie is a visionary, and this coincided with the 20th anniversary of his restaurant. It's very important to acknowledge these initiatives as they were catalysts for us. I'll now look at each project, describe the issues that needed solving, the solutions, and the fundraising process. So to the Museum of Contemporary Art. As shown above, incredibly located opposite the Sydney Opera House, under the shadows of the Harbour Bridge and on Circular Quay, there's arguably no better location in the world for Australia's only institution dedicated to collecting, exhibiting and ex educating in contemporary art. With independent governance, the institution has thrived under the directorship of Lizanne McGregor. Visitors when she started in 1999 were below 100,000 per annum and the institution was close to insolvent. Picking up a theme from this morning, um, at that stage the institution charged for admission and the costs of collecting the admission exceeded the revenue received. So this is a newspaper cutting at the time that I was on the board the first time. When the, when the institution closed for work to commence on the expansion in 2010, visitor numbers were just under 600,000 per annum and the museum was financially stable. Success, however, was strangling the museum. There were significant issues that needed solving. Access, there was one set of lifts and they frequently failed. Circulation was confusing. There was no education space or lecture theatres. School groups jammed the floors of the galleries. The gallery spaces were inflexible. Given the past issues the museum had faced, a focus was required to build a financially sustainable institution. And the building was unwelcoming and certainly not a contemporary signifier. The solution in this case was not to be found in a design competition. There had been several of those. Rather, the museum had been working with architect Sam Marshall for several years, and it was clear he understood the issues and cooperatively developed solutions that worked for the museum and will gain support of the key stakeholders. Given the location of this faux Art Deco building, stakeholder consultation undertaken by the MCA through the design period was key. The solution lay in the car park site located on the northern end of the museum a block of dirt used by staff, and fortunately on the lease. On this site, to the right, Sam Marshall, supported by the government architect, was able to design the core circulation for the museum, create a wonderful new gallery space, a street linking George Street to Circular Quay, containing the museum shop, our first real lobby, the incredible National Center of Creative Learning that Kerry touched on, which contains harbour fronting dedicated exhibition space, a lecture theatre, library, seminar room, rooftop cafe, and sculpture terrace. Just a few slides. Two thirds of the $53 million budget was for this new wing. The balance was to do a significant refurbishment of the existing building, creating new galleries, two extraordinary rooftop venues, office space rented to the AOC and AJ Kearney, and a members lounge. The expansion increased the museum size by 50% and ticked all the issues that needed solving. So has it worked? Absolutely yes. In the first 12 months since reopening, 
visitation numbers doubled to 1.2 million physically and a further 750,000 online. The museum has become a destination, a hang, and the energy is remarkable. So now to the funding. With a remarkable vision, $53 million should be easy. I hear you all say that. <laughs> and at 5 a.m. each morning when I shaved between 2007 and 2012, I looked in the mirror and said that to myself. <laughs> at a dinner in 2007 with Lizanne McGregor and then MCA chair and friend, the late David Coe, Katrina and I proposed that each of the Coe and Mordant families pledge $5 million to kickstart a campaign to redevelop the museum. The first to hear the news was Kevin Rudd, who was dining at the next table. The MCA board asked me to chair the newly instated foundation with the task to raise the $53 million. I agreed on the basis it would be a committee of one. It actually was an informal committee of three, Lizanne, Katriona, and I. I can't count the number of small dinners we hosted with prospective donors. Immediately following the announcement of our kickstarting the campaign, two separate benefactors, within 24 hours, each came forward with seven-figure pledges. This certainly was an endorsement of the very difficult decision we'd made to allow our donation to be made public. And Rupert talked about some of those issues this morning. We were very careful in our discussions with donors and prospective donors not to share the actual design. Not only did we want to avoid a debate, but we also didn't want to leak till we were ready. Managing the community stakeholders was very key. As Rupert talked about this morning, commingling was very important. The state of New South Wales supported the vision quickly, as did the city of Sydney. And by the time the global financial crisis hit, some 12 months after we had started, we were at the halfway mark. We had real momentum. However, the GFC paralyzed everybody. Many very prospective donors rightly became introspective, and it just didn't feel right to continue asking for a while. However, a year after the GFC, we faced a real issue. Those that had pledged were anxious. Would the project happen? It had failed twice before. How long would they be on the hook for? Going into Christmas 2009, two and a half years after we'd started the campaign, I felt we were in a very awkward position. Katrina and I were overseas. We knew we needed a catalyst to not only recreate momentum, but to retain the existing donors. We also needed a way to get the federal government involved. Remember, the MCA is independent of government, so this was no mean task. Lizanne had spent many days wandering the corridors of Canberra without joy. And together, we'd asked so many federal politicians, we were in danger of being banned from Canberra. <laughs> Over Christmas, I advised Lizanne that Catherine and I would increase our donation to $15 million if the New South Wales government would increase their support from the current $10 million, and if the federal government could financially commit so that the project green light could be given pre-June 30, a date by which I felt donors would begin to withdraw if the project wasn't secured. I asked Lizanne to keep our pledge confidential, even from the board, and describe it as a new anonymous $10 million donor. Armed with our commitment and with the guidance of Lindsay Tanner, we were able to secure $13 million from the federal government under a job scheme as we were shovel ready and the GFC, the federal government were keen to stimulate the economy and the state immediately increased their support to $13 million. In May 2010, just weeks before my self-imposed deadline, the MCA announced the project was funded. And in August that year, the first sod was turned in the presence of ministers, state and federal, and the Lord Mayor. In March 2012, the expanded museum opened on time and on budget, just after five years since that first dinner. As I walk past the MCA now, I can't believe the process we went through to create this incredible hub. It was a unique funding partnership between philanthropists and all three levels of government, the type of partnership that Rupert talked about this morning. I should acknowledge the donors, some of whom are in the room today, and just a final photo of the um, institution. 
I'd now like to talk about the Venice Pavilion Project. The Venice story is somewhat different, but again started with issues that needed resolving. Venice was the first Biennale in the world, and the only one with the tradition of national pavilions. It's the equivalent of the World Expo for Contemporary Art, occurring every two years. Last year, 88 countries exhibited, and around half a million people attended. It was established in 1893, and Belgium opened a national pavilion in 1907, and was shortly followed by Hungary, Germany, Great Britain, France, and Russia. As Venice developed this wonderful infrastructure, a cinema festival was started, and then an architectural biennale in the even years between the art. Australia has been exhibiting in Venice since 1954, and in 1987, Australia was granted one of the last sites in the Biennale Gardens, thanks to the tireless work of Franco Belgiornanetis. Australia thus became one of 29 countries to be in the core venue, with the balance of countries seeking space outside the gardens, with the consequential challenge of attracting an audience. Australia is blessed to have this site, and it's the only waterfront site in the gardens. In 1988, Philip Cox designed a temporary pavilion, as you can see, to take up the wonderful opportunity provided by the Biennale authorities. This is an opening, I think probably Doug's opening. And this is a picture of our waterfront. In the ensuing 25 years, not only has the temporary pavilion suffered wear and tear, it has become clear that the exhibition spaces are inflexible and not optimal for the art of today. A new pavilion was desperately needed. The issues that needed solving were the need for flexible exhibition space, a strong architectural statement, spaces for preparation, and a true contemporary signifier. There were added complexities at a project in a foreign land and one under the auspices of the federal government. What was clear to me from Ronnie de Stasio's design competition was that there was an incredible passion for a new pavilion. And in talking to the hundreds of Australian visitors each Biennale, that was also clear. The starting point needed to be an understanding of what could be done on the site, if anything, and the process. With that in mind, Katrina and I approached James Strong and Cathy Keel in 2009 and proposed we jointly fund with the Australia Council a feasibility study. We had no idea what was possible. Imagine our joy when after many months of work, we received the output that not only advised that the Australian Pavilion was the only unlisted building in the gardens, but the only building that could be replaced. The study also fully defined the scale of the building that could be placed on the site, the design criteria in terms of mass, and thoroughly explained the complex approval process and timetable and provided a rough estimate of the cost, clearly subject to design. We read this document many times looking for a catch. There wasn't one. Katrin and I were extremely excited that there appeared a clear path for a new pavilion to be built. Given the federal government ownership of the lease, it was clear the support of Canberra would be needed and the engagement of the Australian ambassador in Rome would be key. The minister was briefed and endorsed a private sector and government partnership to redevelop the site. And with no design, no architect, and no budget, Katrin and I agreed to kickstart the campaign with a million dollar donation. At the opening of the 2011 Biennale, the 54th Venice Biennale, the Australia Council announced the intention to redevelop the pavilion and our leadership pledge. I was asked to lead the fundraising campaign and be a member of the panel to manage the process to appoint an architect and subsequently oversee the project. Criteria were developed by which the architect would be selected, and with the endorsement of the Australian Institute of Architects, every Australian architect was invited to submit an expression of interest and provide their credentials. 67 submissions were received, of which six were shortlisted and then provided a detailed design brief. The focus was to design a venue to exhibit and celebrate the distinctiveness of and variety of Australian cultural and creative endeavour and affirm our cultural ambitions. 
the brief call for a building that must combine design excellence and the highest degree of functionality, minimize operating costs, maximize energy efficiency, and embrace design excellence. The building should be distinctive, providing a neutral exhibition environment and capable of accommodating all artistic forms. The brief highlighted the need for the building to be durable, resilient, breathtakingly simple, elegant in resolution, sophisticated and assured. Importantly, it was key that the artists could own the space. For several days, the selection panel met, had presentations from each of the shortlisted firms, reviewed the shortlisted designs, and unanimously selected Denton Core Commercial, Melbourne firm, coincidentally one of the finalists in the Dostasio Ideas competition. Before I show you some images, I would like to acknowledge Philip Cox, who designed the original pavilion and who supported the process to build a new permanent pavilion for Australia. I would also like to note that the Australian Council and the Australian Institute of Architects have jointly published an amazing book on the Philip Cox Pavilion and the, short, and the six shortlisted designs for the new pavilion. So here we go. I can't show you the finished building as it's still under construction. And the old pavilion was just dismantled last week. This is what the new pavilion will look like. Denton Cork and Marshall have reversed the entry and have designed this wonderful black granite box, taking advantage of being the only water-fronted pavilion. The concept is a white box, the exhibition space, within the black box with one enormous gallery upstairs, creating total flexibility, and all the preparatory and back office space downstairs. Incredibly simple, beautiful, and meeting the design brief perfectly. So now to the funding. If you thought raising money for the MCA redevelopment was hard work, <laughs> imagine trying to raise the funds for a project in Venice. Fortunately, the task was smaller in scale, seven and a half million dollars. And with the remarkable energy of our project director, Elaine Chia, and the passion of Rupert Meyer, the three of us made up the kernel of the group to raise the funds. With the design settled and DCM selected, Katrin and I doubled our pledge to $2 million. We were so excited by the winning visionary design. The Belgiorno Nettis family, who had been instrumental in securing the site for Australia 25 years ago, made a leadership commitment and the Australia Council have not only provided incredible project management for this project, but made a $1 million donation. Many other visionary philanthropists have supported this incredible project. I'd like to thank Alan and Maria Myers, Andrew and Kathy Cameron, the Nelson Mears Foundation, Sir Ron Briley, Denton Corker Marshall, Adrian and Michaela Finley, Finney, Gandal Philanthropy, Annabelle and Rupert Meyer, Malcolm and Lucy Turnbull, and a significant anonymous donor, donor in particular. The support of this group and many others has been incredible. We have the last $1 million left to raise, which we plan to complete during this year. 2015 will be remarkable for Australia in the contemporary art world. We will have the only 21st century pavilion in Venice, a wonderful building that symbolizes the best of Australian architecture creating a space that the 2015 Australian artist, Fiona Hall, will be able to own. So in summary, these two projects have been hard work. I couldn't have done the task without the support of Katrina and the leadership of Lizanne McGregor at the MCA and Rupert Meyer and Elaine Shear at the Australian Council. We're incredibly proud of the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia and in 15 months' time look forward with great excitement to the opening of Australia's new pavilion in Venice. To help create critical arts infrastructure to enable world-class programming has become a real joy. And to do this in both Australia, my adopted home, and Italy, our second home, has been a great honor. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Hi, um, Simon, my name's Giles uh, Filkey. I'm a PhD candidate in the um, Faculty of Art History here at Melbourne University. I'm also an experimental filmmaker and I was uh, performing at the MCA last uh, week where a discussion um, ensued over the uh, funding of the Sydney Biennale. And uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the um, discussion around the trans field uh, sponsorship of the, the event uh, leading to calls for um, a boycott of, of the Biennale. Um, and artists obviously responding to that, how, how they will given the nature of the contract to the uh, immigration detention centres in Manus Island and, um, and Nauru. I'm just wondering if you could um, speak about how you manage uh, the social and ethical kind of concerns for raising funding from large like multinational companies and yeah, so on. I, I can't obviously talk about the Biennale because I'm not involved in the Sydney Biennale, although Katra and I do support it. Um, but I will talk a little bit about um, my experiences at the Tate, um, which I found very interesting. Any donation over £10,000 at the Tate, so $20,000, goes to an ethics committee. And that ethics committee vets the donor, whether it's a corporate or an individual, to determine if there are any issues that might cause embarrassment to the institution. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting discipline, and certainly at the um, museum, Lizanne and I have often talked what would happen if a corporate engaged in an activity approached us wishing to make a donation, how would we deal with it? And, and they're very delicate issues, and um, I, I can certainly understand the, the issue that's being debated about the Sydney Biennale. And they're very relevant issues for students to be discussing. Mm. And thinking about, um, so it's a very good question. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, I think it's easier if I'm standing around. Oh, well, <laughs> Jane. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about Venice. Knowing how incredibly bureaucratic um, Venetian politics is, how was it that that building wasn't listed? And are they racing to list the new one? Um, <laughs> it, it wasn't listed because it was a temporary building. It was put up very quickly. It was largely prefabricated here in Australia and shipped over. And probably was never intended in the eyes of the Venetian authorities to be a permanent pavilion. So they, they had never got round to heritage listing it, very fortunately. Um, but some very interesting things, black granite, which is the external portion of this building, is an unapproved material in Venice. So when the panel received this submission from DCM, we, we said immediately that this material doesn't comply. Um, we'll ask them what alternative materials they'll put on the front of the building, and the architect being a specialist said no other materials. So we thought we'd better go and see the Venetian authorities before we determine that this is the winning design because the panel unanimously supported it. The Venetian authorities said it's, it's not an approved material, but we think the design is so extraordinary, we'll approve it. And, and because Australia's taken this initiative to build a new pavilion in the middle of a European financial crisis with the consequential employment and encouragement, um, the Venetian authorities have been extraordinary. I mean, everything that Rupert and I feared could happen, they found a way through it. And um, being part resident in Italy, I know how bureaucratic it is, but they've gone out of their way to um, support the redevelopment and um, have been extraordinary so far. It, it, would, it, would goodness. Be, it would have to be said that I think... Um, the Italian authorities had no idea what they were dealing with when Rupert Meyer and Simon Warner <laughs> came to see <laughs> with their powers of persuasion and diplomacy. They perhaps never seen anything like it. Um, Fiumetta, did you have another question or comment? Or to Jane? I think it was a very similar question. <laughs> That's all right. But one observation, Mario Bellini, when he was here to refurbish the National Gallery of Victoria, 
So that our management and heritage people in Australia were infinitely more complex and difficult than any Italian body uh, in Milan or Venice. And he had some very amazing uh, commissions there. But it, the extraordinary thing about the Australian pavilion is that it's the one place with a river frontage in the Giardini Gardens, which is you know, strange because Venice is full of river frontages. <laughs> Um, more so than anywhere else in the world, and also the novelty of a new building right in that exhibition mm. space is yeah. going to be extraordinary. So, warmest congratulations to all present on having achieved what is, I think, by international standards, absolutely amazing. Um, I, I'd like to ask Simon to explain the um, system, which I don't think came in under him, but I know Rupert um, Health Institute, which is. The, the group that you've got together, the champions, mm. and how important they've been. Yeah, so, um, this is a group of people who help support the actual exhibition. So it, it costs approximately a million and a half dollars for Australia to mount the exhibition every two years, um, to commission the artist, to retain a curator, mm. um, and to promote and advocate um, for Australia amongst a hundred countries that are exhibiting. So not only are we blessed to have the infrastructure, but having got the infrastructure, we want to make sure we get a share of voice in a global context. So it's not a cheap endeavour. Um, the Australia Council are the lead funder and supporter and promoter. Um, but in order to do the job properly, we have to raise approximately a million dollars each biennale from the private sector. Um, we do that in two ways. We do it from a group of corporate philanthropists and the University of Melbourne has been extraordinary in their support um, for that. Uh, the Balnaves Foundation, um, Maddox, Melbourne and Sydney law firm, and um, White Rabbit, the Chinese-based art gallery. There are corporate supporters and then Three or four biennales ago, um, a group, I think John Caldwell probably initiated it, um, decided to get a group of individual patrons called Champions. And um, each year we've had 60 of those who support the biennale and not only support it financially, but also act as advocates mm -hmm. and um, come. And last year for the first time, we took two groups. So we had 120, which meant that not only did we get two groups of philanthropists to come, but we also had more firepower to promote Australia's presence in Venice, and we will repeat that in 2015. And um, those of you who haven't been to Venice, it's a fantastic thing. And um, those of you who have, welcome back. <laughs> There's two questions. Fiona Sutton from the UQ Art Museum. I'm interested to tease out a little bit more about uh, the, the, the giggles we all had when you said a committee of one with the MCA fundraising, uh, fundraising campaign and, also, and turning into an informal committee of three and the potential changes that had with the Biennale but also with your other experiences around fundraising for, for uh, major campaigns. I'd be interested to find out your ideas on leadership uh, leading a leadership campaign. I, I think everyone operates differently. Um, personally, I'm not a committee person. If I'm asked to do a task, I'll do it to the best of my ability. And if I'm not doing it, someone can tap me on the shoulder and replace me. I have no difficulty with that. But I, I've spent my life attending committees where people report what they haven't done. And um, <laughs> that, that is of no pleasure and value to me. So when I was asked to do each of those projects. I was very happy to take responsibility and get on with it. Obviously, I report to a board or a governance structure, um, but my time is spent doing the task, not reporting on what I'm doing or listening to people reporting on what they haven't done. Now, other people operate much better in groups and lever off each other. Now, having said a committee of one, Rupert and I probably speak most days about Venice, and Lizanne and I spoke pretty much every day on the museum. But at least I knew what my job was, and it was to go and get the thing done. And um, that's how I prefer to operate. But it doesn't mean it's right. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I was interested in both campaigns, how many new converts were amongst your supporters? Because I, when you look at the supporters of a lot of arts uh, fundraising campaigns, there's a lot of names that are familiar to all of us. So I, what was the percentage of new converts and how difficult was that? Um, I think there's a small gene pool of people who are giving. Rupert talked about it a little bit this morning. I think that gene pool is getting bigger. And um, certainly in both the projects that I've talked about, there was significant financial support from new people in the space, either people I knew or people Rupert knew or people Lizanne knew. But it, it's a slow task to broaden the gene pool of givers, as Rupert talked about. And um, it will happen. Um, you know, when, when we started in a public way, I think the first, the first arts board I sat on was with Jean in, in the 80s at Bundanon. Um, when we started to give, we were very concerned about being publicly noted and um, were very nervous about it. But if you want to encourage others, you've actually got to come out of the closet and talk about it. And um, it, is, it is slowly changing and it's fantastic. Um, Tracy Cooper Lavery from Rockhampton Art Gallery. Uh, I just had a thank you. <laughs> um, I had a question more about the design of the the new pavilion. Was there uh, in, what what is actually the floor space of the exhibition gallery? And is there was there a limitation on the size that you could have? Yeah, um, there is a floor space. I'm I'm the least spatial person to talk about. Um, I think. It's about 18 metres by 18 metres, something like that, but I can't translate that into architect speak. It's about the same size as the new gallery at the Museum of Contemporary Art, if you've been there. So it's a very decent exhibition space, but the, the site was specified on the lease, um, and we weren't able to expand from that. <laughs> um, we, we do have a couple of minutes, yes. Hi, I'm Campbell Gray from UQ Art Museum. Um, I'm, I'm interested, you mentioned it and earlier Rupert uh, discussed it to some extent, and that is the idea that the building is the driver for the um, uh, increased interest as opposed to the program. Um, you know, the program that's going on inside the building. Could you explore that a little yeah, further? I hope I didn't say that. Um, I think to run great programs, which is what attracts the audience, you need the infrastructure. So the museum was cracking before because it didn't have the infrastructure to run the programs it wanted. So I see the building as the enabler. Um, now the building's open and active I don't think of it as a building anymore. It's an institution that's 50% bigger, able to do a massive amount of education. We educate 40,000 kids a year in those education spaces. Uh, things we couldn't do before. So the, the building was the catalyst, but it's all about audience and it's all about art. It's, the building is past. Um, I mean, it was hard work, but it's, it's not relevant anymore. I think it would be very interesting, Simon, for students to hear a little bit about the curatorship program in Venice, and and I believe there's a reinvigorated mentor mentoring yeah. program as well, which um, sort of we don't want the Venice Biennale to be operating up here and on an exclusive elite level. It does flow down. Well, the, the the most important thing, and the university has been really critical in that, is is to encourage younger curators. Um, under the auspices of the Australia Council to participate because in Venice you have the best audience you can imagine. So to get curators to see art from all over the world in an intense period of time and to engage with an audience um, is a terrific initiative and through the six months I think we cycle six young curators from around Australia. Um, partly funded by the university, but partly funded by the Australia Council. And it's, um, 
a really fantastic program. The other thing we do is we have a, a program of student volunteers. So I think we cycle about 80 or 90 student volunteers over the six months. They're, they're VSOs in attendance at the pavilion, so they're managing the pavilion and they obviously get a couple of days off while they're there. They can get around and see um, other country exhibitions, see the institutions like the Prada Institute, which Thomas was talking about before. And again, that's a program run by the Australia Council, but they're our, they're our interface to the audience, and they're typically art students and, and really encourage people to participate in that program as well. Just um, wondering uh, what drives you to do what you do and, and what enjoyment do you get out of it? That's an interesting question. Um, Catherine and I are very passionate about the arts. Um, we really firmly believe that if you want a vibrant community, the arts are central to that, whether it's performing arts, visual arts, literature, that that's the type of community we want to live in. Um, I wasn't born here, I emigrated here when I was pretty young. Um, I've done well here and um, I want to continue to live here and really felt that you're on the planet for a pretty short period of time and you can make a difference while you're around and it doesn't need to be money, everyone can make a difference whether it's volunteering, in our case we have the financial capacity to make a difference as well as our time and our intellect. Um, we've met the most incredible people on this journey. Um, we've had extraordinary experiences. Um, we've loved every moment of it, and it's, uh, it's part of our life. And um, we, we want to make a difference while we're around. We, we don't want to create an infrastructure to deal with our affairs after we've gone. And um, we've enjoyed every moment. And aren't we <laughs> um, I'd like you. Oh, so you have, you're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Angus Trumbull. Angus um, uh, I'm uh, from the uh, National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, but I come back to Australia just very recently from the United States, and I was reflecting on your remarks about the process at Tate, uh, whereby proposed gifts are run through a an ethics committee, uh, reflecting uh, over the past 11 years uh, be, being embedded at Yale University in New Haven, uh, the, the complete absence of, of such uh, a system and, and why that should be so, because uh, in that period the university conducted uh, a, a capital campaign called Yale Tomorrow, the purpose of which was, was to raise $4.5 billion for the Yale Endowment, in which as far as I can see there was absolutely no uh, process of ethical mm. oversight. And I'm wondering whether the, the reason for that is, is a difference, a fundamental difference in outlook, that uh, in America the perception is that uh, corporate entities in particular uh, are of the nature of, of uh, robber barons uh, after the manner of uh, um, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Andrew Mellon, Henry Clay Frick and so on, and that, and that, the, and that their gifts uh, are in a sense um, uh, designed uh, to uh, redeem uh, uh, their their activities, whereas uh, elsewhere that th that perception is is simply not there. Uh, I, it's just a thought, and I'm not I don't know whether that's correct, but it is. It's remarkable to me that I've, this is the first time I've ever heard of of such a process, and I think I'd be right in saying that it's 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 almost unknown in the United States. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm on the um, board of my business school in the States, Wharton, and we've just closed a $5 billion campaign. And there was certainly no committee of that nature at all. And, and I did actually ask the dean at one stage about it. And the response, I, I can't clearly remember the detail of the response, but the broad remit of the response was that ethics weren't part of the education system. 
And it, I found it, and you can see in my business how things like Enron have happened, and um, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting question. Well, we did have one instance, but this was quite separate from the capital campaign that I referred to. It was uh, the instance of a very large gift to the university by the Bass family of Texas, which was predicated on the condition that the faculty develop programs of an intellectual nature acceptable to the family with their name on it. Initially, the university accepted the gift, but it was under the pressure of faculty who resisted the condition uh, that the university um, uh, corporation was ultimately compelled by the staff to return the money. And, and I think um, there are some risks in Australia as we try and encourage corporates to get involved in philanthropy that there'll be an expectation of some form of return. And I, I've personally always thought philanthropy is an individual thing and corporates you leave for sponsorship and, um, and not engage them in philanthropy. But um, I think there is a risk over a period of time. People are going to want to have something in return. There's just been a case at La Trobe um, with scientific research mm. um, and it's, it's, it's very problematic mm. uh, with a corporation wanting to sponsor research. Uh, with the inevitable questions around the ethics of those outcomes. Mm -hmm. so it, but my experience on non-profit boards in Australia is most of them do have an ethics um, mm. charter. Uh, I think that's the mm. one area that we perhaps might be here. I think we're going to have to wrap it up because we're trying very hard to keep to a strict timetable. Okay. Um, but before Simon leaves, I just think he and Catriona deserve our absolute gratitude and admiration and respect for, you know, they could have just gone and lived in Italy. But you didn't, you did that as well. And, and aren't we the beneficiaries? And really, it, it's a combination you. of, of your capacity to give but your capacity to give comes from your hard work and your mm. intellect in the mm, first okay. place. And, um, and your absolute generosity and the way you bring people along mm -hmm. with you okay. is, is to really be admired. Please thank Simon and Catriona. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.